All right, everybody, let's uh, start our Kern, count, Kern, count, Kern Cog Public Workshop, the presentation services provided to veterans and their families. Mr. Dick Taylor. Notice I'm lowering this way down here because I'm short. Can you, can you hear me okay? All right, good. Uh, I was uh, about ready to lose my voice and figures because I'm marrying, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm officiating at my uh, son's wedding Saturday. So, uh, but we're, I'm so excited about it. So, uh, uh, my name is Dick Taylor. It's an honor to speak for you, uh, before you today. I'm your county veteran service officer. I, I'm an employee of the county. I'm the director also of the Kern County Veterans Service Department. Each county in the state of California uh, has a counterpart to me. Well, actually every county but two. There's a couple of counties up in Northern California that don't have a sufficient number of veterans and so they share a, a county veteran service officer with an adjoining county. But our mission is pretty much the same as it's been since the, the department was established back in 1944 kind of the towards the end of World War II, and that is to help veterans, their dependents, and their survivors get the benefits that they've earned as a result of their military service. And we're right over here at the same location that we were in when we were established in World War II at 11, not the same building, but it's the same spot, 1120 Golden State Avenue. That, that was back in the days when it was the, that was the actual highway. That was Highway 99 that went right by there. Yep. But I, uh, I thought I'd, ha I'd, I'd make it kind uh, let's see, well, that was back, yeah, let's see, Spanish-American War to then was when? All uh, right. Yeah, I was just a wee lad. Um, so uh, I thought I'd go over a couple of points, specific things that, that we do in our office. And sometimes uh, some of the things that I talk about at some of these presentations, uh, for a few people, it's going to be, okay, I've heard this before, but for maybe some of you, it'll be something, hey, I never knew that. Or, hey, I know somebody lives down the street from me, or the guy that works at, Home Depot maybe doesn't know that. And so uh, we, so there's three parts of the VA. And this is probably a, a, a starting tutorial uh, without getting too uh, elementary, but the federal government, the, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs has three elements. We deal, our county office is a contract uh, organization for one of those elements, and that's the Veterans Benefit Administration, the VBA. There's also one that's called the National Cemetery Administration. They're the ones that run the cemeteries, and they do a great job, and uh, they probably are the, the one of the smoothest running operations you'll ever see. And it's not because all their clients can't complain anymore. <laughs> it's because they really do a good job and their families appreciate it. And then the third is the, uh, we hear a lot about this, and that is the Veterans Health Administration. They're the ones that you hear about people on waiting lists and people dying and stuff like that, waiting to get in to see a doctor. So those three elements are like three stepbrothers. Picture this, three stepbrothers that don't get along and they don't talk to each other. And that's kind of what where we, we play in. So we're part of, part of one of them and we love doing it. Uh, I have a small staff in our office, very well supported though by the Board of Supervisors. I'm probably one of the most fortunate uh, CVSOs in the state because I hear these horror stories all the time from uh, county uh, veteran service officers in other counties that they're always at odds with their board of supervisors and the board of supervisors hates them and they they don't like the military and they don't like veterans and that kind of just goes along with it so yeah. i'm very fortunate that way and this is a it's fun to live in a county where uh, where we where we respect and we honor our veterans and uh, and it's uh, it's a neat just being a small spoke in that wheel but a couple of the the um, benefits that some people don't know about and and uh, i thought i'd talk about them today and first of all, before I get started, I just almost thought about this because I stole this idea from Aaron Hakimi, uh, uh, Colonel Hakimi, as I call him, uh, several years ago. And that is, do we have any uh, veterans here uh, in, in, with us today? Could you please stand? Okay, and I want to thank you for your service. Yeah, that was something that he did years ago, and uh, as you try to do that at the beginning, and it's something that always stuck with me. So, so one of the greatest benefits that is probably the most, one of the most uh, underused, and that is a program for service-connected veterans. And for that term, if you're not aware of it, service-connected means that something happened to you or something happening to that veteran when they're in the service. Like they, their hearing is maybe is not as great as it used to be, maybe got ringing in the ears now, you, you hurt your knee, uh, you have some other kind of thing. So the VA, uh, through a process, will rate that veteran at a percentage. And it could be anywhere from 0%, 10, 20, 30 on up to 100%. So the, 
So in the state of California, as fouled up as California is, they are absolutely wonderful to veterans. So in the state of California, if you're a service-connected veteran and have a service-connected rating from the VA, your children can, an att can attend any California State University, University of California, or California Community College tuition free. Totally free. A lot of people don't know about this, and a lot of times I get remarks from people saying, well, I'm all bummed out because I went through and I never, my dad was a service-connected vet. And you, it's not retroactive. You can't go back and, and get the, uh, the chancellor of the, the university, UC system to get it. But it's a wonderful uh, program. It's not for grandkids, but it is, uh, and it doesn't cover um, uh, books or, you know, rooms or stuff like that, but it is a huge thing. And so we have this huge influx uh, certain times of year when, when people are bringing those in. The other benefit, and this is one that's just getting ready to happen here in about uh, two months, uh, previously only active duty military or retirees, in other words, somebody um, like Aaron that had served over 20 years, could access the military exchange. In other words, kind of like a, you know, am picture Amazon or Costco, but for military. So effective uh, Veterans Day this year, every honorably discharged veteran is going to be able to purchase uh, at, online at military exchanges. A lot of people don't know that. And I'll guarantee you there's a ton of vets, a ton of vets that you don't, that don't know that. Pretty quick uh, process. Uh, and like a lot of our things, I like trying to, I like myself trying the process just to see how it goes, to see how it's going to work out. Uh, you go to a, um, a website called Vet Verify. I can't remember if it's .org or .com. I'm thinking it's .org. Uh, they'll ask for the veteran's uh, name, his social security number, and date of birth. They'll get a reply back pretty quick, like, hey, we know who you are, and yes, you're approved. Or like me, because I've been out for a lot of years, when I got out of the Marine Corps, uh, they say, hey, uh, or the Spanish-American War, uh, they say, we want to see a copy of your DD-214, your discharge papers, and then I scan it, send it to them, and I'll say, yeah, you're in. I had one other little glitch when I went to go sign up because they want you to create a username and password to shop online. Um, I think it said, hey, your email, because County of Kern's now got a, a new uh, a domain, <clears throat> no domain with our new email with Office 365. They said, hey, that's not a valid email. Well, it is. So I had some very friendly, uh, on a Sunday afternoon, uh, uh, customer service rep with the online exchange service came on and click, 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 and I got it handled. and. So they said, hey, by the way, while you're at it, you're part of our beta test group, and uh, now you can buy online. So I bought a couple things just to see how it would go. If you buy anything over $49.95, it's uh, free shipping. Uh, one thing came from Nellis, and another one got shipped direct, direct from the manufacturer. So that's a cool benefit. Um, another really nice one is it used to be, because I also serve on the, the board of directors for the National Cemetery Support Committee. We have a beautiful, uh, just absolute crown jewel uh, National Cemetery off of 223 and Highway 58. It's in Supervisor Scribner's district yep. uh, there. So um, 500 acres donated by Tahone Ranch free of, free of charge. And probably one of the cooler national cemeteries I've ever seen. And I've never been up there, you ought to take a trip. But it, um, uh, there are certain criteria and eligibility requirements I won't go over while I'm here, but previously up until not too many months ago, if you were a veteran, you just knew that if you were eligible or not, and people would come to us and say, well, what do I do? What can I do ahead of time? Because I want to do like some pre-need planning. Well, the VA didn't have anything like that. You just had to let your loved ones know and pray to God that they did what you wanted when you're done. So now the VA has a pre-need eligibility form. And I meant to bring one today, and I did not. <coughs> but it is a, and I could probably pull it up on my phone. <clears throat> if you were to Google a 40 dash and I tried this last night, it came right up. 40 1 0007 VA form. Form will pop up, you print that, and the veteran sends that in, mails it in, go figure. You can't scan it. VA can't, no, you can't scan it. <laughs> it's got to be either mailed or faxed in. Yeah, fax is going to be, you know, it's like yeah. chisel with a thing. <coughs> um, uh, you send that in with your DD 214, and you'll get in about 30 days. I did it myself just to see how it would work. Get back about 30 days of confirmation. Yeah, you're eligible. You're now in our system. So, and then you do the same, the spouse, you know, whether you're a, a male veteran or female veteran, your spouse is eligible to be buried there as well. Not just a Bakersfield National Cemetery, but you can also put that on there. You can't say, hey, I want that spot six feet over from the big oak tree, but it, we, you can't designate a spot but you can designate a national cemetery other than you can't say Arlington because most of us aren't eligible to be buried there. But 
what it does is it confirms because I've had several vets come in and it's kind of unfortunately <clears throat> there's occasionally times when vets come in and let's say they've served in the reserves and this isn't you know our rules it's what the VA makes up <clears throat> many times uh, people serve in reserves and unless they got activated sometimes they're not eligible to be buried in a national cemetery and we get to be the one <coughs> to tell them that when they come in the door and you got a grieving spouse walking in in tears and then you get to tell them hey guess what I don't tell them that way but it's no fun so and that's the other thing that causes the greatest angst is at death people are running around because they just lost their loved one and run around with their hair on fire trying to find discharge papers this gets that solved ahead of time you got that all up all planned so and we're also fortunate to live in a community where uh, all the mortuaries and funeral homes know exactly what to do they know what scheduling office to call um, and they'll arrange it and, and get you set up with a national cemetery but anyway that's a phenomenal benefit uh, it was just uh, just started last November for years and years it was not available and it's just a brand new thing it's not advertised very well yet but it uh, we get people doing this all the time now and you'll get back a little envelope you send a separate one in for your spouse and with the spouse they're going to need a copy also of your marriage license or marriage certificate that's the only other thing you need so that eliminates that run around at the last minute at the at death uh, as to uh, uh, whether somebody's eligible or what somebody's needs are and also eliminates the problem that we see in our office a lot and I and never before I ever was in this job I never realized that there's not really any Norman Norman Rockwell families there's tons of weird dynamics in a lot of families <clears throat> people come in and are scrapping kids are scrapping about where mom or dad's gonna be buried and no no dad said he wanted to be buried at the National Cemetery no he said he wanted to be at the family plot up in Union and <clears throat> so this way a veteran can put that on there and that eliminates all that that eliminates all that super cool project um, our two uh, members of the Board of Supervisors are aware of this but I want to make your um, your board aware of this and I know uh, Colonel Akimi is aware of this too so when 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 you drive uh, uh, when you drive into Kern County from state highways there's a sign that says Kern County line or welcome to Kern County or now go back home or something like that. <laughs> no, I think that's in Texas. It's or in Oregon. It says that. So, um, so some months ago, um, we looked in the idea of uh, because it's the, the California State Legislature a number of years ago made it possible for counties to install in place of the sign that says Kern County Line, big green sign says Kern County Line. In place of that sign, it will say. Uh, that county's name and then uh, besides that it, then it says at the very bottom it says where we honor veterans so in a partnership with uh, County Roads uh, Mr. Pope and Pat Ebel with his office has been very helpful and a partnership with a nonprofit here in town that is paying the entire cost of the signs called the Patriots of Kern and uh, Caltrans and um, in our office over the next few months you're going to see these start cropping up and there's about 14 of them around Kern County you know where Fort where uh, out in Ridgecrest where like 178 and 14 are uh, I-5 99 43 46 gonna be cool so you'll you'll come across these signs and these will be the new new ones that have the new <clears throat> I'm not using the right terminology but they have a certain hotless hotness level in other words when the headlights shine on them it's a certain kind of reflectivity I think um, it's the new one that you know is pretty bright they're green and white uh, there's some that are 60 inches wide by 30 inches tall and there's others that are 90 inches wide by 42 inches tall so some of them are some pretty good size so uh, County Roads uh, and Caltrans and us and Patriots of Kern we're excited about this it goes before the Board of Supervisors uh, on Tuesday it's a simple matter of the each county has each county's Board of Supervisors has the ultimate authority they have to give the okay for somebody to be messing with their signs so it's a resolution that's required by state law but it's not like we had to get Caltrans approval they're just they're partnering with us so it's going to be done during regular maintenance times when crews are out in the area and they'll just have that with them and if they're doing something else or bolt the sign on off take the one off and put the other one on and we're pretty uh, pretty stoked about it because it's it's a cool county that uh, that honors and recognizes our veterans and this would just be one more way that 
the dozen. I don't think there's too many others around in Southern or Central California that I've seen. I've seen some up in, uh, uh, I think Inyo and Modoc uh, has them, but, uh, but not here. So that'll, that'll be a good thing. Another benefit that, uh, and I'll leave some of these with you too. This is an insert that we put in the newspaper. It was paid for uh, out of uh, non-county funds a few years ago. But one of the benefits, uh, particularly for those of us that have, either have elderly or aging parents that are veterans, or a spouse of a qualifying veteran, there's a, a benefit called pension with aid and attendance. And somebody's nodding their head, and, and so uh, it's another one of those kind of secret ninja things that if you don't know about, sometimes you don't find about it until it's too late. Uh, but for the, and it's not for everybody. I mean, it's only for, it's a needs-based benefit for people that, for vets that are having a hard time paying for it. But uh, and what it does is it reimburses that, that veteran or that family for medical expenses for the care of an uh, aging veteran or an eligible veteran spouse for, um, you know, if, if they need help with activities of daily living, going to the bathroom, going to shower, cooking, getting dressed, taking their meds, all that stuff. And I'll give you an example. Um, we concentrate on Kern County, and, and our staff does this all day long, and it's a, sometimes some counties like ours don't even do this because it seems kind of like a real, you know, uh, foreboding task because there's this big stack of paperwork you got to do for the VA. But in my opinion, it's entirely worth it because it takes a load off of a family member so you can either have somebody come into the home or you can have them in a facility. And it doesn't, nobody's going to get rich off of it and it's not going to pay everything, but it pays a huge chunk. And uh, the process or the, the, the basic qualification is the veteran has to have, the qualifying veteran has to serve has to have served one day during a time of war. So that can be World War II, the Korean War, or Vietnam. Doesn't mean they gotta serve on the front lines. It doesn't mean they gotta be, just gotta be one day during that period. Um, also, they have to have served a total of 90 days active duty. The second requirement is they gotta have that, that need medically. So in other words, they gotta have a doctor say, hey, veteran Schmuckatelli needs help with this stuff, and they fill out a form that says they need that. The third requirement, and it's the thing that kicks a lot of people out of it, and that is the, your assets and your income. And a lot of people say, well, the assets are, because um, the assets are about, the asset limit is about 80,000, meaning not counting your, their primary residence, but if they have more than 80,000 in the bank, the VA is probably gonna say, we want you to kind of burn through some of that first before you get down to that. A lot of times people say, well, my, I think my dad or my uncle or the guy down the street probably makes too much money. Well. Here's the way the VA figures out income stuff, and then I'll leave it at this, and I'll tell you a quick story before I wrap it up. Um, let's say that a, a, a veteran is paying $5,000 to a really nice uh, assisted living facility, and they get, but they get $5,000 in income. So they get $5,000 income, but they're paying out $5,000 to, you know, the Bellagio of, of uh, senior assisted living places. In that equation, the VA views that, that income as zero because the expenses totally wash out the income. So sometimes people say, well, I don't qualify. Well, maybe, so let's, let's look first. So the quick story I was gonna tell you, my wife's late aunt, before she was late, while she was still living, she was the, uh, she was the surviving spouse of my wife's uh, uncle who was a, uh, a veteran. We told him about this benefit when we were back there on one of our visits. They live out in uh, Murfreesboro, outside of Nashville in Tennessee. And uh, they said, hey, that's really cool. So they. I have a counterpart like this, but it's for the entire state of Tennessee. So they asked him about it, and they looked at him like they stepped off a spaceship from Mars. <clears throat> so they called me. Well, what are we going to do? Okay, we just took care of it by email, snail mail, and phone calls. And so they got the benefit. My wife's cousins were just elated. Her aunt was just super happy, and she lived a, a, a long life and several years after that. But it made a huge difference in that family's ability to cope because you're a, you're a caregiver, I mean, it becomes like uh, it's, um, it's overwhelming. And I know how that goes. We see it happen all the time. So it's a cool benefit. Try to concentrate on Kern County, but we'll help any veteran or anybody anywhere. If somebody says, hey, uh, these people here that are in my community don't know what, they're ta what you're talking about. Matter of fact, there's a lot of other counties in California that don't even do, don't even do it just because they see it as a, uh, it's not enough bang for the buck. They, they see it. Cr crummy way to say it, but that's what it boils down to. 
So I think that's, oh, uh, two final things. Um, we do veterans' ID cards, county veterans' ID cards. The, the equipment was paid for entirely by Rio Tinto Minerals, uh, the makers of 20 Mule Team Borax. If they have a DD-214 honorable discharge and served on active duty and have a government-issued uh, photo ID, we'll give them a county veterans' ID card. They can go to Home Depot, Lowe's, Famous Dave's, all kinds of places and get discounts. Uh, and it's like finding money laying on the ground. And lastly, uh, you can now get a veteran's designation on your California driver's license. Uh, you come to our office, we, um, we certify your, that you served as a veteran and served on active duty and were discharged honorably. You take that with, to the DMV and pay five bucks and then you get a little thing that's microscopically uh, sized letters and it goes on your driver's license. So with that, I'll open up to any questions. Other than that, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up and, and I thank you for, uh, for letting me speak. Madam Chair, I have two quick questions. Yes, ma'am. First off, thank you for your service as well, sir. Um, if someone was incarcerated, um, you know, done time, and they were a veteran, do their uh, children and spouses have access to their benefits? Good question. So it, uh, probably. That, that, that's the answer. So the, um, matter of fact, we have just started a program through some AB 109 funding where mm -hmm. we're going to be sending out a rep out to uh, Lairdo because – uh, even though they did something dopey and they got incarcerated. Uh, we haven't expanded this to state prisons yet, but we're going to expand it to Laredo. So there's people in there that are incarcerated. They're still veterans. And so one of the best things we can do is, like, let's say you have a, a, um, a wife and kids at home of an incarcerated vet. We can um, – I'm looking for the term – we can uh, uh, get an apportionment of their, uh, I always think about the license plate. You see, out-of-state license plates, to say a portion, it's a, on their trucks. So it's an apportioned amount of their benefit. Let's say they're getting 300 bucks a month. But the wife, and so then when they're incarcerated, that gets put on hold until they get out. So, but the, we can assist the spouse, the, the spouse that, of the incarcerated veteran to apply for apportionment and basically they make a plea to the VA to say, hey, we, you know, the money that our husband was getting uh, or our uh, wife was getting uh, is uh, we were using for taking care of the kids and all this other stuff. And so that's one benefit. The other thing is that they can, uh, they can do the college fee waiver. Okay. So it's hard once a veteran is incarcerated if they're not already service-connected rated by the VA to get that happen because then they got to go to appointments and things like that to get rated. But if they're already service-connected rated, uh, matter of fact, we helped out a couple of vets who are incarcerated, and now the kids are going to college, probably the only kids in their family ever to go to college, uh, to maybe break this whole cycle of recidivism. So does that answer that question? That does, and it, okay. it kind of dovetails into the next question. <clears throat> if an active-duty member was uh, contributed to the Montgomery GI Bill, and they were discharged honorably, and their time ran out for the benefits. Can they qualify for CalVet educational benefits if um, they retired here in the state? Yeah, uh, many of them can. Each each case is different. I'd I'd want to sure. kind of sidebar with you on that. Sure. Uh, there's a number of things um, that they can qualify for. If they run out. As a matter of fact, some of those, depending upon if they have a service connection, some of that can be passed along. Uh, even to uh, even to their spouse for the spouse to go to college and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Thank you. I would Thank I would love much. to yeah. chat with you about the well, I'll be part, calling you. particularly the incarcerated thing and, and also yeah. there's legislation. Um, I can't remember the bill number to put a vet rep in state prisons. Right. Not to incarcerate them, but to <laughs> but to uh, have well, a let's rep. Hope not. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but to to have them available to be able to help because there's a ton of people that, that need that. So when they get out, that they can kind of get a a head start on those benefits and maybe get the pay going and that kind of stuff. Well, I'll be calling you soon. Okay. And, and I have a lot. You've just spawned a whole bunch. And I'm a veteran, and you've just given me a lot of information. Oh, yeah, and, and this of. is just the tip of the iceberg. I can tell right. you. I, I wish right. I knew when my late father, who was a uh, World War II vet that got shot down near Tarawa. I wish, I wish I knew when my dad was still alive all the things I know now because there's a ton of stuff that, right. that I had no idea. I didn't know about the college fee waiver. All my college, my sisters could have been paid for, but he didn't yes. take advantage of that. Yeah. Thank you. Again. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Bring this meeting to order. Please stand for the flag salute.
absolute pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Garola? Present. B. Smith? I'm here. Wood? Here. Pasquale? Here. Mock? Cantu? Martin? Here. Prout? Here. Cryer? Here. Smith? Wakeman? Here. Couch? Here. Scrivener? Here. Miller? Here. Para? Here. Kiernan? Thank you. Item three, public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the committee on any matter not on this agenda, but under the jurisdiction of the committee. Committee members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the committee at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to two minutes with the authority of the chair to extend the time limit as deemed appropriate for conducting the meeting. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making any presentation. Do we have any public comments? Madam Chair, I'm Michael Turner Seed. I represent the Kern County Taxpayers Association, but this is much more a personal issue for me. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about the decline in Amtrak service for people like me who ride it regularly to Sacramento. I want to thank staff for allowing us to have a little extended time and show our PowerPoint that we would like to present through miscommunication, which is all my fault. Uh, it didn't get on the agenda, but staff agreed very generously to allow us to do a PowerPoint. So I hear, that I understand that it's loaded. And I'd like to have Adam Cohen present the PowerPoint for us. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, or good evening, Madam Chairman, Board, thank you. So while that's being loaded, I'll just start with an introduction that um, we were t um, informed that um, they're going to be cutting Amtrak service to Bakersfield and actually making the schedule change less convenient for travelers. Um, so that's what we'd like to show you today and kind of request um, that the COG take action on this um, at the earliest possible convenience um, and request um, scheduling preference and consider um, at no cost to the COG, consider joining and, and seeking representation so that we have future input on these changes. Um, so we'd like to uh, present to you express service. We can go to the next slide, please. So as the COG is aware, you know, Bakersfield is the ninth largest city in the region. We, um, we uh, rank some of the worst air quality nationally. We have limited and expensive air service. Geo we are geographically isolated. Um, and all of these problems um, feed into our air quality issues because it drives people into um, private vehicles. So this is just an example of, of Time Magazine, worst in air quality. And this is just one of many sources. Um, next slide. This shows you, um, you know, our air. And it impacts the health of our young and elderly alike. Next slide. Um, so recognizing this, Amtrak is actually critical not only to our local economy, but it's also critical uh, to um, our air quality and sustainable community strategy. Um, to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions and improve uh, our environment. Next slide. So this here shows what um, the forecast schedule is going to be like. They're actually doing a test um, right now uh, with a maintenance schedule. And their current test basically adds um, an hour of travel time uh, between Bakersfield and Fresno uh, because the, f the first and last trains of the day would stop and end, start and end in Fresno, uh, meaning that it would be a bus connection from here to Fresno um, in the morning as well as the evening on the return. Next slide. And this again shows the same from Los Angeles. 
an extra hour of travel time. So what this means is that a substantial number of existing riders, which accounts for more than half a million uh, between LA and Kern County and elsewhere in the San Joaquin Valley, the significant portion of those half a million riders are gonna be shifted into private vehicles. Next slide. Uh, this shows uh, 125,000 folks that originate in Bakersfield and the over 400,000 that connect in bus connections through Bakersfield. All of these are going to be forced into private vehicles um, if they don't want the extra hour it takes to get to Fresno. Um, so this slide here just, just summarizes here. We're going to see uh, most likely um, increased greenhouse gas emissions and vehicle miles traveled if this proposal proceeds as is. Now we have a solution for this. Um, we can add express service that both reduces VMT and reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Express service would make travel times on Amtrak competitive with private vehicles, um, about four and a half hours between Bakersfield and Sacramento with limited stop service in Fresno and Stockton along the way. Um, this is recognized as a best practice that's already done on Caltrain um, to reduce travel times on that corridor as well. Um, next slide. Um, additionally, we can also reduce travel times to the Bay Area with a bus connection between Stockton and East, uh, East Bay uh, BART um, in the Tri-Valley. Next slide. So this is just showing here uh, the, the stations that we think are appropriate for express service um, along the entire corridor. And I'm going to show you a timetable if we go to the next slide. So to do this, what Bakersfield and Kern County stakeholders are seeking is to switch the early morning train, that's the one that departs at 4.30 a.m., and instead of going to the Bay Area, going directly to Sacramento with limited stop service. And those are highlighted in red. And then in the return, on the next slide, making 704, that's the southbound that leaves just after five o'clock from Sacramento, making that an express train as well. That would leave Sacramento um, right around 515 or 530 and get back to Bakersfield before 10 p.m. Next slide. Um, this here shows a proposed timetable, so they're already implementing express service from Fresno, so we are losing additional service between Fresno um, and Sacramento, we're losing all the added service that they're going to be having. So we're going to lose one train, and then they're adding an eighth train, and we're not going to get that. So all we're seeking is um, this timetable here, something close to it with that express service. Next slide. And this is just showing the same thing in the return. So here, I want to spend a little bit of time here just to show you the, the importance of the travel time. So right now, the entire length of the San Joaquin line is about 5 hours and 15 minutes, and driving is about 4 hours and 20 minutes. And if we were to implement express service, train time would be about the equivalent of driving, um, which would further um, reduce private vehicle travel. Next slide. In addition to that, we can see substantial cost savings for Kern County as well as local governments because they won't need to spend a night for travel in Sacramento. They would be able to go there and return same day. Um, estimated uh, cost savings of more than $300 per a trip per a traveler um, based on IRS mileage rates and or GSA travel rates. Next slide. Um, so again, um, you know, it offers the entire valley um, express service north of the valley or north of Fresno. It would give them two trains a day as well. Um, the early local would connect with ACE. Um, the southbound would also connect with ACE. Um, and express would be faster getting to the Bay Area as well as Sacramento. Next slide. Um, it, we believe that this will increase ridership, reduce travel times, also improve fare box recovery. It would be more efficient at a cost per mile basis based on the increased ridership. And most importantly, um, greater convenience, cost savings, and reduced travel time and emissions and improved air quality for the entire valley. Um, I can't emphasize this enough that the longest trips originating from Kern County and Southern California are those that are going to be impacted because those are the ones that are going to be placed into longer single occupant vehicle trips if the proposal is approved to cut Bakersfield off. Next slide. Um, so we have developed a request as stakeholders um, and the request is to switch 
the, the early morning train and make it express, designate the evening train and express in the return, um, as well as in, work with the Joint Power Authority to work with others to improve our bus connections. Because Bakersfield is the end of the line, we actually have our bus connections through the surf liner as well as the San Joaquins. And so those that go southbound to LA, those travel times aren't ideal either. That the first bus actually leaves at 8 a.m. and gets into Union Station around 10.30 a.m. And the result of that means that business travelers cannot use that as well either to get to downtown LA. Um, next slide. And this is just showing um, all the partners that are part of the JPA. Kern Cog is the only one that is not. Um, even Tulare County, which has bus-only service, has representation to provide input on their bus service. Um, it's free to join, um, and the COG could withdraw at any time with 90-day notice. Next slide. And that um, concludes the presentation, but I do want to just answer any questions that the board may have. Does the board have any questions? Thank you. I, I have concerns because Wasco has a stop, mm -hmm. and a lot of people use that stop, and they're used to using, you know, the train to go to Sacramento, go to Fresno, go to other cities. I, I, I just don't think that's going to work for us. Well, I, I appreciate that, ma'am. Right now, Wasco is getting cut out with service, anyways, um, because under the current proposal, the end of the train is going to end in Fresno um, and start in Fresno early morning. So Wasco regardless is is losing a, a train oh uh, first i heard of that okay um madam yeah. chair may i ask a question other than wasco who else within kern county and well and obviously bakersfield who else is impacted by this so everybody south of fresno is impacted from the cut and service that is planned that includes hanford corcoran wasco and bakersfield thank you Thank you. Mm. Great. I don't know. I've never heard of that. Good evening, Chair, members of the board. My name is Troy Hightower, and I'd like to add some additional comments on the proposed changes to Amtrak service. First of all, I've been riding Amtrak for well over 30 years. On a regular basis, that's my preferred way to get up and down the state. This change that's being proposed is largely due to the interest of the JPA, which is commuter service. And commuter service typically is to get people going to their jobs and back. So their schedule is to try and get to Sacramento by 8 a.m. so they can go to work. Here and in in across most of the state, most business travelers are going to meetings. And those are typically 9 or 10 o'clock. Trying to um, focus on a commuter market out of Fresno or Bakersfield is not very practical, but that's the approach that they're, um, that they're, they're using. To answer one of the, respond to one of the questions about who else is impacted, not only are those cities in um, Kern County impacted, the connections are also impacted because we have connections to Tehachapi, East Kern that all come in through the Amtrak system. Um, one of the impacts that I just learned about yesterday, I was coming back from Fresno, is the late train will stop in Fresno and you have to get on a bus to Bakersfield. So if you tried to catch that late train out of Sacramento, you'd end up only going to Fresno, then you have to get on a bus to come down here. And so I don't think that's practical, not even for a commuter. And so I think this is an issue that I think um, the locals might want to pay a little bit more attention to, even though you may not ride the train. But I think um, Adam Cohen in his presentation mentioned about VMT and, and reducing emissions. So if it's not practical to take the train from here, that means more emissions in the valley. If it's not practical to connect from L.A. to here, then more people from L.A. are going to be driving through. So what we typically want to try and do is find ways to make it easier to ride the train. And the um, express service, in my opinion, would do that. 
if we don't have that, then we won't have any service uh, in the morning. And I think that would, would definitely impact our businesses and government agencies that routinely go to Sacramento. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, right now, if you want to go from Bakersfield to L.A. to Union Station, you have to say that you are buying a ticket from Wasco. Or the next stop so, past Union Station. So I can say now I yeah. can go that way and, and buy the ticket instead of I don't have to say I'm I'm going from past Fresno to Cor L.A. I can buy the ticket past Union Station. Correct. So okay. current current state law stipulates that you have to buy a train ticket in conjunction with an Amtrak bus ticket, um, and that impacts some of the ridership numbers at some of the stations. Um, right before Bakersfield as well as right after Union Station um, because there's a, a fair number of passengers that do that. So as long as you have a rail ticket in conjunction with a bus ticket, that's all right. And you don't have to technically ride, um, you know, you know the, the train ticket, but you have to purchase it per state law. Any more questions? I have uh, Madam Chair, if I could expand on that real quick. What, what they're proposing will happen the same thing with Bakersfield-Fresno. So right now, we have a lot of riders just go Bakersfield, Fresno, and back. Well, if it's a bus segment, you can't purchase that ticket. You're going to have to do that same thing. So that would be impacted as well. Kathy? My question was, what is the timeline for the decisions to be made here? So, so um, they, they've already endorsed this. They are voting on a proposed schedule change to cut Bakersfield and everybody south of Fresno um, tomorrow. Um, they they have proposed to cut a, a, a morning and an evening train. Um, and the, the 718, which is the evening train, is of particular concern um, because that creates a number of – that comes from the Bay Area. And by ending in Fresno, if you're coming from Sacramento um, at that time, you'd actually have two bus connections. You have to go on a bus to Stockton, connect on a train, and then go on another bus from Fresno to Bakersfield. So it's a double bus connection, which makes it even less convenient. Um, so that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, we were seeking, hopefully, you know, for the COG to, um, you know, pass a resolution, um, you know, in support of express service and, and opposing, you know, the cut of Kern County as well as all the other counties south of Fresno. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. I would just like to thank the COG for listening to us this evening and thanks the staff for working with us to accommodate our presentation. Uh, it looks like cuts down the road to Amtrak service to south of Fresno are going to increase. It's going to affect Wasco and Corcoran and Hanford and Tulare County because they have buses from Visalia and Tulare that take people to Hanford to get on the train. But once again, I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, we are going to Sacramento tomorrow. We're catching the 6 o'clock train, and uh, we'll get back at 7 o'clock tomorrow night. But, uh, again, thank you for your time because we think this is a major issue that goes way beyond train ridership, but the effects on SB 375 compliance and other environmental issues. And remember, there are 410,000 people a year that ride buses to Bakersfield to get on the train. What are those people going to do when the train's not in Bakersfield? Are they going to get on another bus to go to Fresno? I really don't think so. And that's, so those people are going to be start driving, being on the road, more congestion for I-5, more congestion for Highway 99, and more pollution in Kern County that we have to deal with with the Air Pollution Control District. So once again, thank you. Thanks the staff for letting us make the presentation. Thank you for listening, and uh, we hopefully can improve Amtrak service and not reduce it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Lieutenant Ian Silva with the Sheriff's Office here for my uh, traditional update on our current con contract with uh, regards to inmate work crews working out in the community. Um, I apologize. I missed the last couple of meetings. I was on vacation, and then I was away for some out-of-town training. So 
I blink and suddenly we're almost towards the end of the uh, first quarter here. So I'll go ahead with those stats. Um, since we started this, this uh, current contract in July, uh, there have been 42 work sites. Roughly 336 hours of detention deputy times have gone, gone towards keeping our community clean. Um, when you add in the inmate labor, that's uh, about another 2,016 uh, 2, hours of uh, man hours of work getting those, those cleanups done. We've covered about 30 miles worth of current highways uh, with estimated cost savings of $49,311. That's our, our hours against what, what it would, would uh, normally cost in terms of a, a wage. Uh, so far, we've been to Bakersfield, Delano, and McFarland. The majority of our work just this quarter has been in Delano. That's where the request and where the, the need has been. However, we've got a, a couple of dates coming up here. Uh, in Mc, uh, we'll be in McFarland pretty soon, and uh, we'll be about back to Bakersfield uh, somewhere in the Ming area to clean up that area. Um, Again, we're happy to, to be involved with COG to uh, uh, get these services out there and help keep the community clean and give our inmates some work to do while they're doing their time. And if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I'll let you get on with your meeting. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you all. Any other public want to speak? Seeing none, we'll move right along. Consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by Kern Cog staff and will be approved by one motion if no member from the committee or public wishes to comment or ask questions. <coughs> if comment or discussion is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered <coughs> excuse me, in the listed sequence with the opportunity for the member of the public to address the committee. We have Excuse me, items A through. Oh, oh man. <coughs> Excuse me. Madam, oh. Madam Chair? Are you okay? Excuse me. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Miss, Mr. Vice Chair, please uh, take note that um, item N on the TPPC consent agenda has been updated there's a yellow copy um, that's been handed out to all the board members and there's another copy on uh, the table in the back that's the only change to the consent agenda thank you so it's items a through o does anybody want to take any of those items off or does anybody have a conflict uh, Vice Chair, I would like to take item uh, G off just for a brief couple of questions. Okay. Okay, then we're looking at items A through O, except G. Motion of consent. consent with the exception of G. Second. Is this a voice vote? Roll call vote. Gorilla? Yes. B. Smith? Yes. Wood? Yes. Pasquale? Yes. Martin? Yes. Prout? Yes. Cryer? Yes. Wakeman? Couch? Yes. Scrivener? Aye. Miller? Yes. And Para? Yes. Okay, now uh, item G. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. I, I have a three quick questions. Um, and one, well, one comment and two questions. One is, uh, and I'm, I'm certain that others, um, other communities feel the same. This PCI is awfully high. Um, I mean, I, I just looked at other communities' PCIs that are lower than ours, and I've been to their communities, and they have wonderful roads compared to some of mine. So I know that these these numbers are not real, and I did read the the footnote on here. Um, and hopefully we can learn how to improve these accurately because the requirement is for us to meet a certain PCI by, you know, uh, ten year in 10 years or 2016, of 2016, correct? Annual road Roughly. needs, well, never mind, I'm sorry, forgive me, that's not correct. Uh, the annual, in the column on the spreadsheet says annual need to fix roads 85 PCI in 10 years, it says, according to 2016 SLRNA, which I don't know what that acronym means anyway. Yeah. 
Uh, it's buried we there's a whole bunch of acronyms on this chart and i do have them defined there but this is the state uh wide local roads needs assessment okay. and i had to go back and read it too uh the um, uh, this is a survey that's done every two years in part funded by the league of cities and uh supported by and, and uh uh, each, uh, uh, you guys remember Margot Yap came and gave a presentation on that needs assessment. Uh, uh, this is that information that she puts together. And uh, the uh, uh, sometimes it's hit and miss with the reporting, and so they will do a statistical estimate to estimate what that uh, uh, city's uh, uh, number might be. I was at Ridgecrest last night, and they had a similar issue where they have one of the lowest values here. Mm -hmm. they, they said that that was in 2016 and that they've done a lot of work, and their latest numbers are up around up in the 50s now. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, uh, the, um, uh, the information here from that uh, study uh, also indicates what it would take for your community to – bring your PCI up to 85 in that study. Under SB1, we if you bring your uh, PCI up to 80, uh, you don't, uh, uh, pavement condition index, uh, 80 out of 100, uh, uh, 100 being perfect. The, um, uh, once you bring that up, uh, you can use these new revenues, the new uh, uh, Senate Bill 1 uh, gas tax revenues for road maintenance, of which two-thirds of the new gas tax increase is going into road maintenance, and half of that is going to your local communities for uh, uh, improving your roads. And so here's a rough estimate of what uh, that, that amount would be. So uh, what we're showing you is that uh, even with uh, uh, the, those rough numbers that we got from that study back in 2016, that countywide we're seeing an average of about 28% uh, of the funding needed to get up to an 85 PCI in 10 years. Uh, if you only get up to 80, it's about 38% of the funding. And so that's really the point of this. Uh, uh, we didn't have any better information other than that one kind of uh, similar set of data. And so we're, we're hoping that we get more, uh, like the city of Ridgecrest last night, we'll get more of that information updated and, and, and uh, uh, be able to take the rough estimate out of this uh, uh, current table. Thank you very much. Because that's a, I look forward to that particular presentation that you're, you're, you talk about that we have because it gives me a sense of what's going on. But when I see these numbers, that's not reality for me. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if any statistical formula other than people looking with their eyes on some of our roads that have just gone to base. Um, uh, another thing, too, and uh, this is coming from my city, um, matching funds. When we get this de gas tax money, we've had some concerns with some of the folks in our public works wondering if there are any kind of uh, matching funds that would have to be utilized, or could we use the allocations of the existing funding that's coming in to cover those costs, because we don't have them. Yeah, this is a formula-based program. There's no match requirement for these funds. It's just like your current gas tax apportionment that you currently receive streets and roads mm -hmm. uh, uh, there are some extra strings attached one of them being you must uh, provide a list of projects you plan on working on in this fiscal year uh, by the middle of October a and so your city councils will need to be wor uh, acting on that here next month that's correct and uh, the standard template that they're talking about is that currently available for us to start using to document those uh, yes, it was just uh, came out last week, and uh, uh, it's an Excel-based uh, template. And uh, there's also some new numbers uh, that, uh, yeah, and it's been sent to all the cities, uh, all, all the t all the TAC members. So, um, I guess that kind of spawned another thing too. If we have to get quickly on some of these projects, we have regularly traversed roads that have been utilized for multiple decades. And we now, all of a sudden, now have CEQA requirements that are being, and uh, BLM requirements, and environmental requirements on existing roadways that hundreds of people drive on every day. And all of a sudden, all we want to do is fix it before it washes completely away, and it's going to happen sooner rather than later. Um, pieces of big chunks of the road are coming out. And now we have to go through this. So this slows down those projects and exacerbates the cost. So we need help. I think a lot of communities have help, need help like that as well.
Thank you very much. I appreciate it. With that, I have no further questions. Thank you so much. Motion. Mr. Vice Chair, I have a question or, or, or comment uh, on this item as well. So uh, first of all, I just want to um, say that, uh, yes, I do agree with the PCI. And actually, Arvin just had their uh, pavement management study. And we're uh, at 49, uh, not 59, although I would like it to be uh, like that. Uh, but this also shows the need that uh, although all the money that c that's coming in with SB1, there still needs to be, you know, a lot more to get to that point. So I want to thank the members of uh, this COG that uh, took the trip to D.C. to lobby our federal officials for more money because we need them to act. And, and we need to um, see what we can do collectively to, to tackle this challenge because we're all dealing with this. And so uh, I just wanted to, to make that point. And, um, yeah, so let's, uh, let's see what we can do to get more money to, to fix our roads. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I'll make a motion that we approve this item. I'll second. Roll call vote. Garola? Yes. B. Smith? Yes. Wood? Yes. Pasquale? Yes. Martin? Yes. Prout? Yes. Cryer? Yes. Wigman? Couch? Yes. Scrivener? Aye. Miller? Para. Yes. Thank you. Item five, conformity analysis and amendments to the 2014 Regional Transportation Plan and 2017 Federal Transportation Improvement Program. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. The conformity analysis announced for changes to project phases and our projects in the 2014 Regional Transportation Plan or the 2017 Federal Transportation Improvement Program. The Regional Transportation Plan Amendment updates one county-wide location. The Federal Transportation Improvement Program Amendment in includes revisions to the State Highway Regional Choice Program, the State Highway Operations and Protection Program, and the Transit Program. The documents were available for public review starting on September 1st on the Kern Cog website. Comments are due on October 2nd. Public comments received during the 30-day public review period will be incorporated into the final document scheduled for consideration and adoption at the October 19th Kern Cog Board meeting. The action requested is that the chair open the public hearing, take public comment, and close the public hearing. After that action, please vote to continue the adoption of the final amendment documentation until October 19th. With that, I'd open the public hearing. Do we have any public comments? Hearing none, I will close the public hearing. Move the recommendation. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Item six, there is nothing. Item seven, Caltrans report. Good evening. Um, very brief and to the point report. Oh, oh. There. Usually I don't have problems having people hear me, but. Uh, um, so my first. Um, project is going to be the Shafter Wasco ADA ramp um, improvement and that's on State Route 43 in Shafter and in Wasco both uh, which they're doing ADA curb ramps currently the contractor is waiting on the arrival of some custom drainage plate plates which were requested by the city of Shafter so as soon as that happens he can um, continue uh, on the Kern Avenue uh, pedestrian overcrossing ADA compliant upgrades on State Route 99 in Kern County at the Kern Avenue pedestrian overcrossing. Uh, this is a Caltrans shop project. Also, the other one was too. Uh, deck pour should be completed this week. Project on schedule for completion March of next year. The Delano uh, Roundabout at uh, State Route 155 and Browning Road um, intersections was open. The intersection was open to traffic on Wednesday, I believe. Projects should be completed by the end of October. 
And then we have the Famoso, which is on um, State Route 46 and 99, bridge replacement. Uh, contractor will start site preparations on October 2nd. The Kern County Seismic Restoration, that was on um, State Route 99 at Airport Drive overcrossing and at uh, 99 in the Golden State Avenue uh, separation. The project is complete and, um, and is in plant establishment for one year. The Taft Highway 2R Rehabilitation. Um, that's a pavement rehabilitation on 99 near the city of Bakersfield, north of Herring Road, overcrossing to Pacheco Road, undercrossing. Bid open, bids were opened on September 7th. Security Paving Company was the lowest bidder. We should be getting that started soon, hopefully before we go into winter suspension, because about this time of year, that's exactly what happens. State Route 46, um, which is uh, taking this is what we call segment 4A. That's to widen State Route 46 from two lanes to four lanes uh, between Lost Hills Road and I-5. And the project um, advertised Monday, September 11th. Bids will um, open on December. In December, I don't have the exact date. And I look forward to reporting on this. It's, it's December 4th? November 4th. Oh, November. Why did, OK. Well, Neil told me December. so. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to go with you. <laughs> so, I, like I said, I look forward to reporting on this. This is a great project. So, and that concludes my presentation. Unless there's questions. Thank you. Any questions? Or complaints. I take those. Too. <laughs> Seeing none, uh, item 8, Executive Director's Report. Good evening, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chairman, and Board Members. Had a busy a couple of months, and I will try to be brief. Uh, I attended the C California Transportation Commission meeting in Oakland in mid-August. Project uh, that is very important to many people in Kern County was uh, received an allocation of 192 million. That's a, the project known as Kramer Junction. The intersection of 395 and 58 will finally, finally be fixed. Uh, there will be a brand new freeway that will be just north of 58. Um, you will see work uh, commencing in the ne next several months. It's a very important project, even though it's in San Bernardino County, uh, to the people of Kern County. In fact, uh, I would argue that there are more people from Kern County using that section of 58 than there are from San Bernardino County. Uh, your, your staffs have attended two STIP workshops here in the Kerncog board, boardroom. There's at least two more, possibly more. Um, it's amazing what happens when we have money. It was uh, a very easy process when we had no money. And, and now that we have sig significant amounts of money, um, coming to a consensus over how we spend that money is more difficult, but we, we will certainly get through that. Uh, by December. Thank you to um, Council Member Wegman and Council Member Pasquale who joined me and uh, Miss Napier in Washington DC along with our neighbors to the north from September 5th through 8th. We met with House and Senate uh, members and their staffs as well as DOT staff and White House staff. It was a very productive meeting. Uh, we actually spent almost 45 minutes with uh, Senator Feinstein. It was a, a very productive meeting with Senator Feinstein. Um, thank you to uh, the new CTC Commissioner, PVK, who visited with us earlier today, and thank all of you who visited with him. This, this was his first uh, meeting with COG, with COG staff and uh, COG board members. I also took him on a tour with the City of Bakersfield of all the work that's going around uh, in Metro Bakersfield. He does have a very good understanding of not just the needs in Metro Bakersfield, but in the entire county, in, including um, Eastern Kern. Uh, I actually met him uh, over the phone about three or four weeks ago, but spent time with him in Mammoth Lakes last week at a CTC workshop uh, that went over issues. Um, that we have in the Eastern Sierras. That's wh where I learned, and I think he shared with many of us, that 
there is more truck traffic on Highway 58 in Kern County than there is truck traffic on Interstate 80. That, that was uh, news to many of the people uh, on the CTC staff and their members who more closely associate themselves with Sacramento, but it is true. The 2018 R RTIP workshop number three is 10.30 a.m. Wednesday, September 27th at Kern Cog. Many of your staff members have been attending. Please uh, continue to remain engaged in that process. Um, CTC meeting, the next CTC meeting is October 18th and 19th in Modesto. There are several items of interest to Kern County on that agenda. I will be attending and uh, several of your staff members will be at attending. I want to congratulate everyone on all the member agencies on the amazing ATP success rate. Over the last three years, we've um, managed to capture $32 million in the last th three years. We just recently had a, a s relatively small several million dollar uh, ATP augmentation, which you voted on on the consent agenda. We are absolutely the most successful county of our size in the state. So congratulations to all of your staffs for producing quality applications and all your staffs for delivering those projects on time. In just a minute, I'll go over, I'll touch on our delivery rate. There's a transit symposium in downtown Bakersfield, Thursday, November 9th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. If you want some details, please let me know. Item D that was uh, approved on the TPPC agenda, uh, Mr. Ball mentioned that there's some strings attached to this SB1 uh, money. Uh, I want to remind you, all of you that operate transit systems, that uh, the new money for uh, transit operators is only for operators that meet their fare box ratio. Uh, for all of you, except for Delano and Golden Empire Transit, that's 10 percent. Delano and Golden Empire Transit, that's 20 percent. Item F uh, that was on the TPPC agenda, I have some updated numbers for you and I want to congratulate again all your agencies. If you remember last year, we talked about how our agencies collectively deliver more than our uh, allocation of, fe of federal funds. We were uh, roughly 106 percent. I set a goal for the staff and all the agencies of 125 percent for this year. I'm happy to report and I want to congratulate everyone on achieving 134 percent. So we spent uh, 34 percent more money than was given to Kern County and, and that's how we deliver projects in Kern County. Congratulations to all of you and all your staff members. And I know I can uh, sometimes be annoying to your staff members about delivering uh, early and often, but it pays off. And this is how it pays off. We're, we're in the top, uh, probably top 10 counties if you want to look at, maybe even top five counties in the state. Congratulations. And I, I want to shoot for 140 percent next year. That concludes my report on this agenda, Madam Chair, subject to any of your questions. Item nine, member statements. Do we have any member statements? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned and I'll turn it over to Madam Chair. We'll try this again. <laughs> okay, we're into the current Council of Governments agenda. The roll call stays the same. Okay. Uh, public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the council on any matter not on this agenda but under the jurisdiction of the council. Council members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. Speakers are limited to two minutes. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Do we have any public comments? Seeing none, we'll go to the consent agenda. The consent agenda, all items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by Kern Cog staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the council or public wishes to comment on any <coughs> questions. We have items A through E. I'll second. 
Roll call vote. Garola? Yes. E. Smith? Yes. Wood? Yes. Pasquale? Yes. Martin? Yes. Prout? Yes. Cryer? Yes. Wigman? Yes. Couch? Yes. Scribner? Aye. Thank you. Item four, memorandum of agreement for managed parking prices pricing study, Ms. Napier. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. Um, as part of the 2017-18 overall work program, Kern Council of Governments approved financial assistance for a parking pricing study to provide, to provide an economic analysis of potential sites and managed parking pricing. The City of Bakersfield has agreed to initiate the work necessary to identify issues to be addressed in the development of the parking study. Um, this uh, memorandum of agreement has been um, approved by the attorney and it's before you tonight for approval. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Any Thank questions from the public? Yes, my name is uh, Terry Maxwell. I live at uh, 2420 Pine Street. And I would urge the, uh, the council to reject this um, expenditure. Uh, these studies have been done in the past. Uh, there are two significant studies that have been done. One uh, as recently as about 10 years ago. They always come to the same conclusion. If you're interested in what that conclusion was, please see me uh, down at my restaurant. I'll explain them to you. Uh, there are a couple of members of the city council that are pushing a P bid into the downtown area. And I think that they're using, they're going to be using um, this as one of their motivations for getting people on board with it. I would prefer that they go ahead and get the P-bid beforehand rather than afterwards. I think it's important that the KernCog be, be understanding of the fact that why spend $50,000 if once you've spent it and it's used to try and convince a group of people in the downtown area to do a P-bid and they reject it, you have wasted $50,000. Why don't you take the time to let the people in the downtown area decide whether they want a P-bid in the first place, because if they don't, then this is $50,000 that you could save. Uh, I also want to point out that uh, when it was brought before the public uh, in city council, it was talked about as a parking study, not a pricing study. So. It's a little bit of the semantics, but uh, you also, if it is truly a pricing study, you could easily go to one of the companies that sell uh, the meters and sell the meters that, as a matter of fact, that we put into the downtown uh, parking structure, and they will probably do a study for you because it's in their best interest to show a study that says, yes, you can do it in Bakersfield. Offhand, I own a restaurant in the downtown area, and I can assure you there are very few people that are going to be coming to the downtown area if you start putting in parking meters. Um, that's just my personal opinion, but it does carry weight because I have been in the downtown area for over 18 years, and I know a lot of the downtown business people. This would be a huge mistake, and I think it's a waste of $50,000. I encourage you to reject this, to, re to come back to it at a later time if you want to spend this money. Make sure that some things have been done first before you start spending $50,000. That's a lot of money. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Smith? Move to approve. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Item number five, transportation authority, none. Con congestion management agency, none. Meeting reports, none. Executive, executor report. Good evening again, Madam Chair and board members. Um, we will be ho uh, Kern Cog will be having an information booth at the Kern County Fair, which started last night, September 20th through October 1st. This year, we're trying something uh, different. We are manning the booth with many of our partners. So the booth will be manned by as what uh, Kern Cog staff, Amtrak employees, Calvans employees, Golden Empire Transit employees and Kern Transit uh, employees. Thank you to all the agencies uh, who have agreed to help man that booth. And of course, they will be talking about um, Amtrak, Calvans, Golden Empire Transit, as well as issues that uh, Kern Cog deals with. Rideshare Week is October 2nd through 6th. 
We will also have a information booth at the Desert Empire Fair in Ridgecrest from October 20th to 22nd. And our RTP outreach, which many of you have been uh, involved with, received input from over 5,000 community members in the past two years. Uh, subject to your questions, Madam Chair and Board Members, that concludes my report. Yes, uh, tomorrow we uh, have uh, quite a few events simultaneously going on. It's first of all the grand opening of our Garden in the Sun or uh, newly renamed Las Palmas Park. If you've been anywhere near Arvin over the past three weeks, you will understand why we have named it Las Palmas. Uh, and we're also going to be opening up the new street, uh, Walnut Street, that will lead up to the high school um, in its second phase and also our inaugural Hispanic Heritage Month Fiesta. And so uh, we understand that it coincides with the first week of the uh, Kern County Fair. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that uh, we had plenty of time to get all of our park stuff in order, making sure that there weren't any delays that pushed back the event. Uh, but next year, hopefully, it'll coincide with uh, uh, Mexican Independence Day and El Grito. Um, you guys are welcome to, uh, to attend. Uh, the VIP reception and program starts at 4 p.m and the Kern Community College District will be there to make a special announcement. So I uh, hope to see some of you guys there. Thank you. M Madam Chair, I, I forgot to go over our folder, if that's okay. Yes, go right ahead. And uh, Mayor Garola, Garola reminded me. So there's an article written by <laughs> Mayor Garola in your folder. A copy of the presentation that was given by Mr. Cohn, Mr. Hightower, and um, Mr. Turnipseed a copy of our cash disbursements over the last several months, the 2018 Regional Transportation Sustainable Community Strategy Board meetings, and we were in Ridgecrest last night. And uh, you can take a look at that uh, list and see when we'll be with your city or with the Board of Supervisors. Thank you and your clerks for uh, all, all the arrangements that have been necessary. So between now and November 21st, by law, we need to visit every single city council and the Board of Supervisors in order to get our sustainable community strategy uh, ultimately approved. Directions to 2050 flyer, that's what we'll be going over in these presentations to all the city councils. The flyer for workshop three, which is September 27th. Timeline for the next four months, and we may be dark in December. Outreach efforts about articles pertaining to Kern Cog. A copy of the um, delivery rates that I went over earlier with the note on top about the revised percentage of 134%. And a flyer about electric vehicles. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I want to encourage everybody to, when you see um, a police officer, and I embarrass them all the time, I go up to them and I say, I want to thank you for your service. I think they're, they need uh, some support from the public that we do appreciate their service. Um, and they're always really happy when somebody comes up to them, just like a, a veteran would too. So um, I guess this meeting's adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.